Hey everybody, I'm Chris. Hey, I'm Bill. Have you ever asked yourself, what is your superpower? Everyone has a superpower. Most people just don't know what it is. We're going to help you uncover it. This podcast is all about helping people figure out what their truly unique superpower is. Superpowers, what's yours? Hello! And welcome to the Superpowers Podcast. We are here, Corona style, with Michael Katz and my partner here, Chris Cunningham. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another uh, Superpowers Podcast show, uh, one of our first remote uh, conversations. Uh, hopefully, we don't have too many of these and we can all be uh, released from pandemic mania. Um, so we have, uh, we have uh, MK on from MParticle, a lot to cover on Mike's, uh, Mike's journey, both career-wise and personal. Uh, MK, before we kind of kick off, it, it feels sort of natural to sort of talk a little bit about your, how are things with you? You're out east, you're in Southampton, coping, family, your your son, everyone's good? I, I'm good, yeah, everybody's, everybody's good. A um, little bit stir crazy. Today's not super nice out, but um, yeah, we're, we're hanging in. I feel like it's, uh, it, it's all kind of a mindset. Right, like there's no way around it. Like we're all we're all stuck indoors. We're all stuck living in Groundhog's Day. And you can either tell yourself that you're okay with it and do the things that make you happy in the confines of 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 everything that you have to deal with, or you can just kind of mope around all day. And so it's kind, it's kind of like being a founder. Yeah, it, it, exactly. I've been miserable for years. So this is, this is, <laughs> this is perfect for you. Yeah. yeah. You're like, finally, everyone's miserable with me. Totally. No, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm under house arrest uh, officially now. So it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm reading. They've been after you for okay. years. They've been after you for years. Totally. You know? yeah. Okay, I, felt, I actually feel bad. I didn't ask about, I forget your other dog's name. I, I got to ask about Maggie. So asking about your family and not asking about your dogs feels, uh, feels incorrect. So how are... The question about the dogs I have is we have a we have 11 year old uh, dog and he's never been more he's he hasn't been walked more in his life. I actually think he's kind of confused because he's like, I'm used to two. What the hell's going on? Yeah. 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 I, I wonder, like, when everything gets back to normal, the dogs are going to be like, what the fuck just happened? Where did yeah. go? I, 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 I thought yeah. this is what I thought we were living. Yeah. Well, so, um, so, like, so, you know, okay, uh, during during this time. Um, consumption of food has it gone up or down? Consumption of alcohol, consumption of TV, and consumption of reading have they all gone up, down? What? Reading has gone up. Alcohol has gone down. I'm basically not not drinking. Um, Good for you. Yeah, I, like I want to come out on the other side of this better, healthier, stronger. Right? Like you have to look at it as an opportunity to to grow. Um, and so that means a lot of reading. Consuming a bunch of podcasts, um, some some uh, TV consumption. So I'm watching Ozark. I'm kind of halfway through. Have you guys caught the? Yep. Yeah. Yep, not, not, not caught up. Take it easy. Not caught up. Take it easy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm I'm only like halfway through, but um, yeah, just trying to trying to spend time doing things that are like productive. Because it would be really easy to eat a bunch of food and to drink every night and to completely kind of let yourself go. But then it's like you get into this vicious cycle. So I'm trying to kind of hold it together. Right. And, and for, and for our, our viewers out there, what book are you currently reading or what book did you just read that you'd recommend? Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits. I do. Yeah. What's the, uh, give, give us the underlying uh, narrative. Uh, who, who wrote it? James Clear, I want to say. And it's basically, um, you know, how to, how to uh, break down your behaviors to to accomplish the things that you ultimately want to accomplish, um, and dealing with the psychology of it. Um, I also just finished the rise of of Superman. I don't know if you guys have heard it, but it's about yeah. getting into the into the flow state, um, being able to kind of train train yourself to get into a mindset where you reach like peak performance and creativity and, and, it, and it goes through a bunch of really cool examples with uh, extreme athletes. Um, Never Split the Difference is is one I've been recommending to a ton of people by Chris Voss, who is the former FBI lead hostage negotiator. Incredible yep. book. And awesome. then 
Um, yeah, some some more stuff on just if like you keep, if you keep going, it just turns into a brag. Um, you've read more books in the last week than I have in the last three years. So congratulations! And I'm still drinking, by the way. So <laughs> I'm drinking. I'm reading. I'm drinking. I'm I'm reading less. I am keeping the workout going, but um, so I think well, I'll meet halfway with with your uh, with your uh, your strategy. I, I like it. I like it. Um, good, good to balance it out. So MK, you know the sh the 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 uh, our show is called Superpowers. Uh, in case uh, you didn't get the memo, and um, and our our journey on these conversations is very much about uncovering and unearthing what is uh, what's everyone's unique superpower. And and we uh, we 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 uh, we've enjoyed those conversations with previous guests, and a lot of people I think know you and your your background as a as a serial entrepreneur. And um, hopefully we can uncover. Uh, a little dirt and also a lot of insight about uh, what makes uh, MK tick. So I think a good starting point is uh, your your background and uh, and where you're from. I think you know the one thing that we've always uh, had in common. At least we have one thing: uh, the Bostonian uh, roots. Uh, and and yeah. So where where did you grow up? And tell us a little bit about your background, childhood. MK is a little guy. Boston scumbags just find a way to come together. Isn't isn't that nice? Beautiful thing. <laughs> You know, I got to tell you, I, I was hoping, you know, you know, we have an hour together. I was really hoping we didn't hit this. But for not one, not two, but three years, I've had to endure both of you at the Super Bowl. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and like, I'm not really a Patriots fan, but like when you're at the Super we, Bowl, we you know, know. Well, we you know. got to root for somebody. So, so like, are, do you guys both now just become Tampa Bay fans? Like, what what's going on? Like... I, I would say the only anxiety, the only real anxiety I've had over the past few weeks, I was like in the middle of working out last week and I had like the oh shit moment that Tom Brady is on the Buccaneers. And it was like, I kind of had to like pause because I'm like, well, what the fuck are we going to do at quarterback? And the only thing I'm praying for right now is that we sign Cam Newton. And I don't think we're going to, but I really hope that we do. Yeah, my, are you gonna, uh, gonna root for? Are you gonna root for Tampa Bay? It's hard I'll, not to. I'll root for. Look, I'm gonna root for Tom Brady and Tampa. Like they're they have a really good defense. Their run defense is is incredible. It was like top top three last year, right? So uh, it's gonna be like I'll I would root for Tom Brady and kind of anything he he does. He was gonna go to the Adobe. He was gonna speak at the Adobe Summit, and I was gonna go just to see him speak and and. And I kind of hate Adobe, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> out of my room for the Bucks. There You're you pulling, go. Pull it, pull in for Tom. Pull in for go Tampa, and we're gonna we're we're, we're in our we're in our reset uh, mode, Bill. But honestly, I I coped with it probably easier. There's such larger issues at hand, and the fact that he decided at least he's winning through a pandemic with uh, with 30 million a year. But uh, it made it for me. It made it a little bit easier with his departure because I can't really focus on Tom Brady uh, uh, at this moment. We, All we right, let's go back to young Michael. Let's go back to young Michael. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, I grew up outside of Boston in a in a town called Worcester, Massachusetts. Worcester. I I, I knew somebody was going to say it. I wasn't sure if it was going to be you or Bill or me. I was definitely going to say it. But that's the uh, that's the response that everybody gives when you say. When you say Worcester, you think about uh, Toll Booth Willie, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, spent uh, spent eighteen years there, born and born and raised, and then went off to college at at Syracuse, upstate New York. Moved back to Boston after school. Lived in in and around Boston for about five years uh, before starting my first company, which became InterClick. Um, so, so, so have you, who, so everyone who knows you knows you've started all your companies with your brother. Is yep. he your, is he your only sibling? Uh, we have a, uh, an older sister as well. And she's, uh, she's based out in the Bay area and she does, like, we always joke, like she does real work. Like she's a speed therapist and works with, uh, uh, children and, and, and the elderly. So she does, she does incredible things. Unlike, unlike us who just move data between systems. <laughs> It's and, and now and are you who's who's older you or Andrew? Me, yeah. So I'm 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 the middle uh, kid, which probably oh explains man, a lot. that explains yeah. a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, he's the he's he's the youngest. Now, if he was older, would he be the CEO, and and you'd have to be like the president? Probably, yeah. But 
I uh, I pull rank on him. Um, Do, should we fast forward to your superpowers that you have a highly talented uh, and smart brother with a tactical know-how, and it just gives you an unfair advantage? Who, who, who by the way, is completely <laughs> fine just kind of staying back, being kind the of like kind the good of hearts, like it's co-founder. Yeah. You've just been – it's just completely unfair. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I come over the middle. I take the bumps and bruises, and, and, and he gets to kind of sit back in the pocket and, and enjoy it all. Um, no, I'm kidding. Like, I can't, I can't do what I do with, uh, w without him. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it works out great because I think, you know, not just me being the, the, the older brother, and I think, you know, the, the more business minded, whereas he's the more technical minded. Um, it also kind of frees him up to do all of the great things with the with with the tech team and the and the platform that he's done over the past twenty years. Did you guys have any co-founding stories as kids, like selling Matchbox cars or like hustling lemonade or whatever? Like, what was going on in Worcester with like AK and MK? Like, did you guys fit, did did you start doing any entrepreneurial things together at an early age? And what was that tipping point when you're like, hey, we could do some we could do some shit together. Let's do it. Probably before Interclick. I mean, the, the earliest stuff that we were doing, we weren't really doing together, but like he would sell candy to his classmates in elementary school. I'd be selling like baseball cards, you know, doing all the all the shit that I think kids did in the in the 80s and probably early 90s. That was like somewhat entrepreneurial, but never, never together just because we're, we're a couple of years apart. The, now, okay, the best part about it. So, so one more important one. Transformers or G.I. Joe? Both, man. I was, I, was, I was a kid of the 80s, so my parents stuck both of us in front of the TV for hours and hours and hours. So it was sugar cereal. It was as many cartoons as we could consume. I was, I mean, the whole thing, like the fact that we're here is just absurd. <laughs> Jimmy Superfly Snooker off the top ropes. Every time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We were like, well, I was a big WWF fan back in the day. Like we would beat the shit out of each other. We would brawl. <laughs> in between like so we'd be watching tv and then a commercial would hit and it was like full-on wwf fest and then the second the commercials were done it was like nothing had ever happened and this was like a repeat for hours and hours and that was wild it used to drive my parents fucking bonkers crazy so the best part about being an older brother is like you can beat up your younger brother like at what point could you can you still beat him up today if there oh, was a fight for sure yeah 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 but it's it's also unfair because I've I've boxed for like twenty years at this point. And I've done Muay Thai for like fifteen years. So like there's there's probably a lot of people I can I can beat up. So uh, <laughs> that's not that's not like something I'm I brag about or super proud of. Yeah. All right. So yeah. to talk talk about Syracuse. What did you major in? What did you do there? I partied. I cheated yeah. on tests. Found girls. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding, or at least partly kidding. Uh, so I actually graduated with, with two degrees, one in finance and, and another in economics. And it was partly because I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. I've, I've always loved economics. Um, I think that that was probably the better of the, of the two degrees, but I felt like uh, getting a finance degree yeah. would at least ensure that um, I was employable after after college. Uh, I wasn't really sure kind of what that what that meant, but I knew that like finance was a place where you could go and and make a bunch of money. Did you want to, did you know you wanted to stay in? Like, how did you end up at Syracuse? Like, I, I kind of I was envisioned you had like a moment from like the town with like Ben Affleck when you're like you got to get out of here and get really far away, sort of thing. Like, how did you pick Syracuse? Did you consider Massachusetts? uh did you what other schools did you look at i'm just curious how, how you ended up there i uh i looked at a, a number of schools in the northeast and then some um in florida like university of miami and university of florida i uh i chose syracuse sight unseen um it came down to uh to to syracuse and and, and miami and i you know I, I think i had i was fortunate enough to have like a little bit of wherewithal to know that if I if I went to University of Miami, like I probably would have ended up in a gutter somewhere. Um, and well, isn't it amazing? Like, so you guys have younger kids, but yeah, when you have older kids, you go look at schools as if like I, I think with my son, I looked at like twenty one schools. Yeah. Um, me, like 
I got into school and I was like, hey, mom, can I visit? And they're like, yeah, listen, you'll see it when you when you go to move in like, <laughs> yeah. to school. You didn't go visit. You didn't go visit 21 schools and go across the country. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Like I, I was going to go there and I was going to go there kind of no matter what. And uh, it's, like that's kind of what college is about. You throw yourself into the situation and, and you kind of figure it out. So I never would have thought you were an economics major. Never. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, did, you, did, you, did you did you enjoy school? Did you enjoy studying? Like something strikes me is, did it come easy for you? Like, were you that kind of annoying guy that didn't have to work super hard, but you got good grades? I got decent grades and I probably could have and should have worked a little bit harder than, than I did. Um, but I would argue that that's not the point of college. Right. Like that's one of that's one of the yeah. things that you should be doing in college, but you should also be enjoying college. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I always I always say college is about figuring out what you want to do with your life. But it's also kind of that maturation to adulthood. Right. Yeah, yeah. Understanding how to live on your own, cook a little bit, you know, doing all the doing all the things you're going to need to do later in life. Exactly. And, and meeting a, hopefully a bunch of great people that. Yeah. You stay in touch with for for the rest of your lives. What's which, your which you have exactly? Yeah. Okay. What's uh, any any um? Give us a good. Uh, do you have a good Syracuse story that you haven't shared with uh, with folks? Um, um. What what are your what are your more memorable uh, moments uh, at, at school there? I don't think that there's anything like super extraordinary. We had yeah. a normal. I think. Um, normal college experience we yeah went to class we went out we drank we uh we hung out we partied we went to class we sometimes skipped class we, we <laughs> kind of did everything we did so, everything that i think most college kids do yeah so mk it, so so in the in this in the story of small worlds how small worlds get smaller yeah. uh i bought a place in the city uh my my the building that i live only has three apartments per floor um, so there's only two other people on my floor. Um, directly across from me is a guy who was in the same fraternity as MK in college. What's, you know, talk about small worlds. That's nice. um, and, I, and I asked him, I said, hey, is there anything MK did that was crazy? And, uh, and he was like, well, when he was a pledge, uh, he got pissed off at the brothers. So he pissed in their, in their punch right before a party. Is that true <laughs> or false? Uh, to, to be honest, and I'm not denying it, I don't remember. Uh, it's, prob <laughs> it's probably true. I was like, that's something I could see MK doing as a like young, you know, 19 year old. Yeah, I mean, like we we definitely went through uh, a bunch of stuff. I mean, this is you know, this is mid 90s, right? Which is a kind of a far cry from what you're allowed to do these days, and so. Uh, I don't know. Like if, especially if I was a couple drinks in, who who knows what I would have done in, in, in that mindset. <laughs> no, no judging. So a, a, after school, your first gig was it in Center or Zephyr? What, tell, tell us a little. Like how how did you get your first job, and what were you thinking about? Kind of applying your finance background. Like when you started thinking about your career, yeah. was it just like what was available? Like who's going to accept me? How do I get my first? You know, my my first gig, and trying to understand that that kind of initial working working for a company, and then when that shift sort of happened from the when the entrepreneurial bug kicked in. But we'll get to that. Yeah, well, you know, second semester senior year, I started interviewing with a bunch of companies and had a couple of job offers from um, larger companies, including a couple banks, and then I got an an, an offer from. Uh, a company called Zephyr, which was one of the first internet consultancies, and they had just a really cool office and a bunch of free food. And it, it wasn't like rows and rows of cubicles in this kind of massive thing. And they were they were paying more. And the decision ultimately I had to make was, um, do I want to move back to Boston or do I want to go down to the down to New York City with with the rest of my friends? And I was like, look, this is college is over, like adulthood really starts now. And um, uh, my the, that job with Zephyr started, I think, four days after graduation. Right? Wow. And so, you know, while a bunch of my friends were taking the, the summer off or at least getting like a few weeks or, or, or a month off, 
like I just dove in and I was like, look, this is this is go time. I'm I'm on my own and 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 here we are, right? And so I started I started working yeah, like four days after after graduation. And you know, Zephyr was an incredible place. It was where I learned so much about building culture and using um, using culture as um, as an asset to yeah. drive growth and and not like not like bullshit culture, not just like perks and benefits and you know free lunch and foosball tables and that kind of stuff, but um, really creating values to to uh, um, you know aggregate a team of like minded people and empowering them to do really great work and, 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 and how to empower that in terms of meaningful compensation and creating um, highly autonomous work environments and, and, and things like that and, and seeing the importance of, of culture in terms of creating a, a successful uh, company, but then also learning how not to grow. Yeah, what were, what were some of the mistakes that you identified with, with the folks that you're working with? Like obvious things that just how you were, how you see the world and how you were born. Like what were things that you just observed that, man, if I ever start a company, I'll never, I'll never do this. I'll never take this approach. Bro, they blew through like a hundred million dollars in like 12 <laughs> months. And it was like, I'd never seen, I'd never seen anything like that. We went from having everything at our at our disposal to the dot com uh bust and um there being like a uh you know huge round of layout multiple rounds of of layoffs and then there was a fire sale of the assets to nec by that time i was kind of long gone but i you know for for me that was my first yeah uh, professional experience and i'm like wow you really have to be mindful of the investments you you make as you're growing the company, you don't just get to spend money on anything and everything. So, so, so many people, you know, think that, you know, kind of entrepreneurism, you know, is kind of like, you know, deep rooted. It, it, w at what point did you know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Like, was it growing up? Was it in college? Was it through like the Zephyr experience? Like, yeah. Uh, I, so I, I do believe it is, it is deep rooted. Um, I think growing up, you know, my my dad uh, is an entrepreneur. He's always uh, worked for himself, and so I, I looked at that as like that's that is what I'm going to do because that is the example of um, success, right? Yeah. And so yeah. I think I think it started with just seeing that every day, but as a kid, I didn't like. I don't know about you guys, but I didn't have visions of like what I wanted to be when I was when I was older. I was just like kind of happy being a kid. Like I know some people are like, oh, I want to be a fireman or a police. I was like, I remember thinking back, like, I just kind of want, I don't know, like I wanted to marry a beautiful woman, right? <laughs> right. Well, the, 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 it's it's fun. It's it's interesting with your if you can touch on that a little bit as far as the what you. Um, what you what you learned from watching your dad and probably his hustle. And I don't know if your mom was working at the time or she was with three kids, but I, I, I think uh, we, we, it'd, be, it'd be, I think, interesting to learn a little bit about that kind of outside of you and uh, your brother beating each other up and watching WWF. It'd be interesting <laughs> to know like, what, what you sort of learned and what they were doing that sort of said, this is what I want to do. It could have been the work ethic. It could have been the sacrifice. Well, I think it was, I, I think, you know what it was mainly about was was leadership and being being a leader not a not a follower that was you know that's yep. definitely something that they uh repeatedly kind of etched into into my brain but then it then you know it goes it goes beyond like the 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 parental influence i you know looking back now as a, as i'm thinking about it i always identified with kids who had kind of the same um, kind of in, inherent beliefs as well. So my best friends growing up, whether it was like in Worcester or at summer camp or wherever I was, were also really entrepreneurial themselves. And and I don't think I realized it at the time. Yeah. Um, but all of those people that I that that I was close with throughout my childhood and, and growing up all went on to do really entrepreneurial things as well. I think that's 
I think that's super interesting, Bill. I don't know if you, you, you had the same experience growing up, but when you look, and even today, right, look at kind of your, 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 your base of friends, I imagine, because we have a lot of overlap with our circles, there's more, there's more entrepreneurs, but I think you, you, maybe you realize it or not, or you don't realize that you tend to gravitate to those that kind of have that same itch, or maybe they're also unhirable, which I've all, I, I've always felt <laughs> for most of my life. Um, but that's interesting. You said that, that, you know, it's like, Hey, these are people that I gravitate to. And I'm sure that's, that's also, also been consistent as you've kind of gone through your career, as far as the other people you want to associate with. Well, yeah, I mean, look, especially running your own company and you know, whether it's being on like the entrepreneurial side of things or on like the, the executive side of things, it can also be like a really lonely place that, that ultimately very few people understand. Right. And so, um, I typically find myself, um, gravitating to and getting along with people who understand the stuff that that I'm kind of constantly thinking about or stressed yep. over or um, or have kind of become obsessed the, over. The, the one thing I'll, I'll say is being a CEO, you know, could be the loneliest job out there, um, you know, you know, and that's why I believe having a strong co-founder um, and, and having a strong co-founder that happens to be your brother, um, you know, might, might be Not hitting fair. the lottery. It's unfair. What? it's unfair. Yeah, it's unfair. It's unfair. Well, well, so, so there's a lot. Hold on. There's a lot of shit we got to unpack here. So, number one, we didn't talk about the fact that you met your wife in college. Yeah. Um, and have you been together ever since then? No. Uh, we we knew each other in college. Oh, you didn't date in college. We did not date in in college. Um, but her her roommate and you know arguably like her probably her her best friend was my closest girlfriend in college um and so uh like closest I think, girl space friend right yeah yeah exactly okay closest girl space friend um and we um we, we would see each other a bunch and it would be like in passing and it was like she was always one of these people like i'd say like hello to hey what's up and then you just like you keep walking you don't even like wait to listen to the response and she would do the same thing to me, so there was like a general awareness, but never anything kind of meaningful. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. We'll get back to that. We'll get back okay. to that. The other thing that that um, unpack is, you know, Zephyr went through. You know, you said you've never seen anything like a hundred million dollars. Um, so I, at the same time you were at Zephyr, I was at DoubleClick, um, and I was actually thinking about this uh, the other day. We did at DoubleClick because I worked for the CFO. We did a Eight hundred million dollar convertible debt round, mm -hmm. um, you know, literally right before the dot com bust happened. Wow. Um, I maintain to this day that had we not done that round, double click would not be in existence. Like literally, they wouldn't have made it through. That's how bad the dot com bust was. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to skip ahead, but I feel like it was. It's important. M Particle just announced. Yep. that you had raised a slew of money literally weeks before COVID and the pandemic happened. Is that, you know, and by the way, a, a lot of great companies, because we all know DoubleClick ended up with Google and it's, you know, it, basically all of Google's non-search monetization, like, um, and, and literally it wouldn't have gotten through the dot-com bust. You know, yeah. there, there are going to be a lot of stories that come out you know, over the next month and year of like, hey, this company did X and survived it. Had it not, there's going to be a lot of companies that don't survive. Like, do you think M Particle is the new double click? Like, had you not raised this money literally weeks ago, yeah. you know, would you, do you think you'd been able to get through this? Um, it's, it's tough to say. I mean, obviously we're, we're extremely fortunate to have raised the, the round and how much money did you raise? So we raised uh, forty-five million dollars. Amazing. So, um, yeah, we're 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 really lucky that the that the timing worked out the way it, the way it did. Um, you know, ad admittedly, we had we had closed the round like a month prior, so it wasn't yeah. like it wasn't kind of down to as down to the wire as much as it seemed. Like the announcement yep. was 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 much closer. But I mean, look, you know. Um, the one thing I'll say is that, like, I've always uh, and, and and my my parents have always kind of made fun of me about this, but like, I've always said things things just kind of naturally tend to work out for me, and I don't know if that's because like 
I have somebody or something kind of looking over me for, for whatever reason, probably because they know I can't do it on my own. Um, but I've always got like really, really lucky. And um, I think this is, this is just another example of that. But I, I, I would also say that, you know, in, uh, in, in the times that we're dealing with today, with respect to, to COVID and you know, the, the, the pandemic, um, you're seeing kind of a clear bifurcation of businesses that are becoming stronger and businesses that have become so weak that I think they're ultimately going to going to go away. Um, we had a really strong Q1, one of our best quarters ever. Yep. And we're, we have incredible pipeline for, for Q2 and, and, and the rest of the year. And so when you think about the, the types of things that we help companies with, it's, it's about moving data for the purpose of driving digital transformation and customer experience and never has that been more important than it is today. So I, I would also argue, you know, even if, even if we raise less money or potentially no money, um, I think that these are, um, you know, these are, these are tailwinds for, for businesses like, like us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, to, sorry to cut us off the, uh, the 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 linear timeline here, but I thought it was it was it was poignant, timely, and poignant. Yeah. Um, and, and we want to come back again. We want to come back to uh, to M Particle. Um, love to hear uh, um, for for our viewers uh, the your interclick journey. Um, yeah. And when you, when you decided to start yeah. interclick, where you were, was it yeah, after? What you were wearing, um, <laughs> or what? what you wore. Um, how how and where did that? Uh, yeah, with the talk, talk to us a little about that journey, and also curious, you know, from from kind of assembling. This is your first your first company. You've been an analyst. Uh, you you know you learned a lot. You are now ready. You saw an opportunity. I, I'd like to explore that. I also think it's really interesting to. I believe a lot of great companies are are born out of either. A high level of pain or frustration. Um, I don't know if that's the case for you. That's something I've seen. But where, yeah, how did it come about? And then what was the, where, how did you and your brother sort of say, let's go attack this? And then again, for our viewers, maybe just explain what InterClick was as, as well as you can, because I think you remember. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so from, from Zephyr, then I went to Accenture for, for a few years. I got bored of being on bad projects in, in, in bad cities. And I was like, I just got to get off the, off the road. I took a job at a small healthcare consulting firm in Boston. And I basically just like took the first, you know, pretty good job offer I, I got. And I got there the first day and I was like, oh shit, I, I screwed up. Like this is, I don't, I don't want to be here. Um, and so was that your, was that your mulligan? Everyone's got everyone always seems to have a mulligan on the road. Yeah, I, I I think I have probably a couple, but that was like when when you know you know, and it was like day one, minute two, and it was just like oh boy, I really uh, I really screwed this one up. But I'm I'm here and I'm gonna give it I'm gonna give it a month or so before I kind of make that that final determination. And so a week later, I was like I'm 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 done. I'm toast. Um, and my my mulligan was was three days. Yeah, literally, I went to a company and I quit on the third day. Yeah, that was my and moment. Like, you know, congrats for having that conviction. Like, I, I think I was like a little bit too scared to admit that I made such a bad mistake because it's not it's not easy. But no. when when you know, you know. Yeah, no, when you know, you know. It's yeah. unbelievable. So, well, so you you were miserable there. Is that when you said, "Fuck it, I gotta I gotta start a company." Uh, well, I had I had been talking to uh, to a good buddy of mine who he had started a separate company and he had some ideas based on some of the things that he was seeing, and so it wasn't it wasn't that the you know interclick was born out of this um, this this pain or this massive vision. It was based on some things that that a friend of mine had had seen, and he felt like there was a there was a pretty good um, at least short term opportunity and uh i knew nothing about uh digital advertising i knew nothing about advertising yep there. um it was just something that i was never interested in and but i felt like just coming off of um a few years at accenture i got i got good at excel and 
PowerPoint and could analyze numbers and um, you know the the early vision for for interclick we were effectively like an, an ad broker um, and so yeah. we were doing yeah this is like mid 2000s right so we were arbitraging a lot of a lot of media and and, and, and building relationships and we uh, we got really profitable really quickly um, so we started the company literally with like thirty thousand dollars and um, we were I think 90 days in, we had like a million dollars in the bank, right? Because you could do that. You could do that yeah. back. Then. Oh, wait, wasn't it ringtones? I'm trying to remember. Aren't it was like, like sling. Totally. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it was anything. Like we were, we were like, we were brokering uh, affiliate deals. We were, we were creating our, our own relationships and OEMing certain products. Um, yeah. It was, it was just about the hustle. Right. I think when, when we first started or when we first met, you were a did it. Um, yeah. That was the product that we that we brought to you guys was this this ringtone offering. Um, so that, so for, for so for people going, what the hell is a ringtone business? T t explain it. Well, before with a straight, or, with a straight face. It, oh yeah, I know. Uh, I mean, I think I think some people will will remember this, but like before smartphones, you could you could buy premium ringtones. So instead of like the standard ringtone that your phone came with, you could play a song or you could play a jingle or it was like, it wasn't like music, but it was like mu Muzak, right? Yeah. And, uh, you could like, you could customize it for like 99 cents. And, and Chris, these were, these were flip phones. These were not, there were no smartphones back then. So. Oh, got it. I won't share what I have on here at the table. Um, MK was, uh, was, was Ari Trisdale's thumb play in that same. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, they were they were they were like one of the big players. We were like, right. you know, we were the the small guys, pretty lean, really profitable. But um, you know, that was a that was a tough business because you were dealing. That was such a nice, eloquent way of saying you were the better business. You were the lean, profitable one. They were the big ones. Well, they they exited for a few hundred million dollars. So I definitely don't think we were the. The, the, better. the better one. How big did um inner? Can you give us uh give our view? Kind of how, how big did InterClick get? Well, uh, but, but also when when did when did your brother join InterClick? Did you talk about this this friend that you had? When did you when did you grab your brother to start building shit for you? Um. Well, you know, pretty much right after uh right after my friend's father handed me the check and was like, hey, make make this work because I'm not gonna write another one. I was like. Well, now I gotta I gotta start building some stuff, or if we're gonna use um, third party technology, I need some sort of technical oversight. And so, yeah. and my brother uh, was he was still working at uh, uh, in, in ed tech company at the time, and I was like, look, I just need some like technical guidance, like kind of help me figure out what I need to do. And then as it became more serious. Um, pretty quickly then then we kind of came together and we're like look you're the you're the you're the tech dude i'm the i'm the business guy let's uh let, let's run with this nice yeah so, so yeah so um we yeah this so this is 2005 or so and we were we were in boston we were working out of a, a place called the, the the CIC, the Cambridge Innovation Center. We were one of the first tenants there, which is like WeWork before there was a WeWork. Um, really cool, really cool space. And uh, rented by people from MIT and Harvard. Yeah, yeah, ba basically. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, we got to a point where we were like, we gotta we gotta like control our own destiny and build out the first like our own technology. I think we were using like. Whatever, like fast click or value clicks ad server was back in the day. I forget the yeah, yeah, yeah. Of it. But um, we're like, we gotta, we gotta control our own destiny. And at, at that point, you know, where where you're in, and I just become like ob obsessed. It was like every free moment that I had, it was learning about digital advertising. And yep. um, I think like as our learning curve started to flatten out, like our growth curve started to accelerate. Right. It was like, if we kind of keep going, there's a, there's a really good business here. And, um, my business partner, the guy who had like the original, um, idea called me up. I'll, I'll never forget. I was like, yeah, this is like summer of 
2007, I was like in the middle of getting a haircut. I was like, Hey, what's up, man? He's like, uh, we, sh we shot the shit for, for a little bit. And then he's like, so how's, how's business? It's like, good. I think we're, you know, we're on pace to do, you know, potentially like 10 million in, in revenue this year. He's like 10 million. Holy, holy shit. Like this is, that's incredible. Let's sell. And I was like, well, uh, like things are starting to go really well. Like, why would we sell? And you know, like he, I think he was looking at it more from the perspective of like, well, I'm a, he was just the investor. He, he wasn't like operational. Yeah. And so like, if I can even, if I can even, you know, get $10 million for this business, I've, I've turned, you know, 30 grand into a large chunk of, you know, $10 million. And so it put us in a kind of weird spot. We talked, me and him talked about it over the course of the next few days, but you know, we, uh, we, we ended up basically agreeing to disagree. I wanted to stay with the business and, and see it through. And he wanted to, he wanted to get out and, um, uh, like no VC was going to invest in us at, at that point. Cause it's like, well, why, why is one yeah. co-founder cashing out? And then we were obviously like way too small for private equity. And so we found, some uh some non-traditional investors that were based down in uh down in miami and we did this whole reverse merger and became a, a public company traded over the counter and yep. kind of dealt with like a bunch of bunch of weird shit over the course of the next couple of years but do, operate... do you do you do you regret that move so just for the viewers you know you know going public is usually like this huge event um and you go on a road show and you know teach investors about your business you know uh the route that Ant went down was basically merge in with a public into a public an existing public shell um yeah. so you don't kind of get that whole road show and analysts picking picking you up do, do you regret doing that or do you just think it's part of just your path i you know i i don't i don't regret it because it's not like we can go back in in time and i think hanging on to to regrets is is not super healthy or, or productive would i recommend it to anybody else fuck no no yeah. way it's we did it great way to put it as hard as humanly possible i mean it is it is really hard and it creates a number of challenges um that i could i could probably spend an entire hour talking about um so i don't think it's it's a recommended path but it was at the time really our our only option to get cash into the business and to get um my business partner who at that point wasn't wasn't helping the business yeah. out, out of the business well you said it your mk you said it yourself i mean you, you needed capital and there's alternative ways of, of of raising money the convention you know you either do it sort of as a standalone or you're you raise from venture and you give up equity or maybe there's a debt facility you, this is what you had to do but i do agree that I think the 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 glamour of kind of IPO from when we all grew up in the space has has sort of uh, dissipated. Um, so so can you we because uh, we want to get to M particle just yeah absolutely talk a little bit MK talk a little bit about um, your you know the the sale to Yahoo. I think uh, there may have been some turbulence uh, through that period. Um, would love to give and share any insight um, or learnings about what happened and what you're at liberty to or want to talk about through that through that through that period yeah so I'll, I'll i'll just kind of bridge the gap real quick um so we were you know we, we were the small obscure ad network we were late to the market we were undercapitalized. we we uh we we operated through the last recession 2008 to 2009 we grew 150 percent that that year and then 2009 we grew 100 percent again and so at the end of 2009 we uplisted to nasdaq um did more of like a real ipo albeit albeit like a, a small one um became like a real public company and then yeah. operated that way for the next couple of years had bill join the board of of interclick in in 2011 um, and then Yahoo came to us uh, later that year. Uh, they were one of our big partners, so they had a front row seat to a lot of our growth. And they were like, "Look, you know, we we love what you guys have have done. We have this vision to to create um, premium media and 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 to supplement it with uh, premium ad targeting capabilities. And our 
you know, our personalization and our ad targeting products have become antiquated and we love what you guys have built. And, you know, does, w would you have any interest in kind of joining forces and, and hopefully having kind of one plus one equals three? And we're like, great. It got me out of operating as a public company CEO. Yep. Um, you know, it gave, it gave me kind of like the, the validation that I think like all kind of first time entrepreneurs want, where it's like, all right, I, I'm actually, you know, halfway decent at this, at this thing. And, um, and it, and it kind of gave us, uh, um, an opportunity to go bigger, further, faster. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, within, within a month, there was the first CEO change. And then two months later, there was the next CEO change. And then two months after that, there was another CEO change. And then two months after that, there was another CEO change, right? And then you had like all this. I remember that head. I remember those headlines coming out, and it was just insane how many how many new leaders came through that period. But, but let me ask you a question. So you know, so you know, first time entrepreneur, you know, you do this, you know, weird, you know, merge into a public company, but then you actually, you know, achieve it. You're a public company CEO. You then sell a company to an S P five hundred major, you know, company. Um, you know, you have created everyone who knows Interclick knew like the Interclick guys. You didn't know, you know, like you were scared of them. You love them, but I think everyone from the outside looking in was like, "Man, that's a tight group of people who will seemingly do anything for each other." I think a lot of talent came out of Interclick. Um, so you, you know, and and you were passionate. Like, I mean, you're you were so freaking passionate about the business and your people, like. Did it ever dawn on you that like, hey, I can uh, like with four CEO changes, like, fuck this. I could be running this company. Like, did it ever oh, dawn yeah. on you to like to like, hey, I'm going to I'm going to become an executive at an S&P 500 company? Yeah, well, like, interestingly enough, the um, the day that Marissa got announced as uh, as CEO. And so, so at that point, Ross Levinson was yeah. interim CEO. They brought Mike Barrett in as as CRO. Mike and I had grabbed lunch, and we were talking about me being the the COO. And that was like that was lunch, so that was like twelve thirty by like four o'clock. <laughs> he was broke that Ross was out, Marissa was in. I was like, so I texted him. I was like, oh, I guess that's not happening. He's like, Yeah, I was supposed to get on a plane. I just I left the airport and I'm going home. Wow, never knew that. Um, yeah. And so, uh, it, it also, um, it also had a lot, uh, uh, to do with me starting another company too, because I think yep. my time at Yahoo made, made me realize that the team that we had put together at Interclick was, was really special. And Absolutely. that I don't think that we got necessarily the, the credit that we deserved. Cause I, I looked at the executives at at yahoo and it's like these guys are these guys are knuckleheads and we're we're better than them at at every level and like we need to build again and and and, and prove that to to ourselves and, and to the world but yeah i think it became really clear really fast um well two things one i thought like we, we'd be able to go in there and like change the place yeah it was like it was too broken to to fix um and then the second thing was like um, yeah, there's just, you know, there's, there's levels to this. And I think we're, we're really like, we're really good. And yeah. at, this, at this period before M particle, um, were you, how were you spending, were you, were you kind of a product centric leader? Were you, did you have kind of a commercial side? I mean, obviously I know you're not coding, but at this stage, just before we get into interclick kind of maybe describe where you were gravitating to, where you felt like you're your skill sets and what you, you, you were kind of excelling at, like what, what were those things that you, you felt that you kind of were, were, were able to shine the most, uh, in helping your company? Well, I think stylistically, I, I've always tried to lead by being on the front lines. Right. And so, um, continuing to be in market, uh, not on, not on every deal, but on, you know, the, the strategic ones. And, um, you know, I, I kind of pop into certain deals here and there to, to show executive support and to, and, you know, our, our mantra at MParticle is to, is to make business personal, um, uh, not just like through technology, but, but also the way that we approach 
business. Love, love that, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. And so, like, I've I've always looked at my job as a CEO uh, as uh, like what I do is I create equilibrium, right? Um, my job is not to be the best product person or the best um, operations person or the best salesperson or certainly not the best engineer. My my job is to make sure that given all of the resources that, that we have, the demands of the market, the competitive forces, um, you know, whatever kind of resource constraints there, there may be, that we're able to you know, maximize output and we don't become kind of unbalanced or, or unhinged in any you know, one or two areas. And so that's, I think that's how I lead. It's kind of to, to oversee a lot of things and make sure that we're not too far over our skis in any one area. So, awesome. so MK, you, you, you know, you, you mentioned culture and I know culture was huge at Interclick. You mentioned it, you learned it at Zephyr. Um, do you have any kind of like now at M Particle, do you have any kind of corporate brand values that you talk about? And, and most importantly, now that we're all working from home, leadership has never been more important. So how are you leading your company today? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, for, for us, it's uh, first and foremost is just making sure that communication doesn't, doesn't break down, right? Um, I don't know about, about you, but it was like, our one day one of everybody being remote and probably like two or three processes had surfaced where it was like things were were clearly slipping through the cracks and i was like wow that didn't that didn't take long um yeah and and so that was that was the the, the first week or two was just digging into all of our all of our processes and our communication protocols to make sure that like we weren't dropping the ball anywhere. Yep. And I think like we've we've addressed a number of of things and there's still probably um there's there's still probably a few things that we need to to tighten up there, but um in this new environment, it is all about making sure that everybody knows what's going on because we don't benefit from kind of being able to congregate in you know, one or two major offices, right? So we're headquartered in New York. We have a, uh, about 140 people in the company. A little bit more than half of the company works in New York. We have a we have a big presence in in San Francisco as well. And so it, you have to make sure that now that everybody's uh, dispersed, that you know, uh, information, good information, is able to cascade down from me to the leadership team to everybody else. Or else, then you end up dealing with um, not only bad information, but then cultural issues. People gossiping yeah. and and and, I, and the rumor I, would, I would think outside of the funding that Bill alluded to earlier that you secured, you know, prior, which obviously was 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 huge. The fact that you've been around a few years and you have some core leadership. We know a lot of your guys, that, you know, that have been there for a while, and you've had the brands been out there. You have a customer base. I, I'd imagine there's been, there are advantages of having some processes and infrastructure already in place prior to this new world. Imagine trying to sort of course correct, or if you didn't have sort of this structure in place, but you, you guys have had a few years under your belt. So this is a good segue into M particle and, and, um, and, and maybe to start again for, from the top for, if you haven't heard of M particle, um, what is it? And, and uh, a little bit about the business. Yeah, uh, so we are a customer data platform. So um, you know, the CDP space has become you know, really hyped up over the past year, year and a half. There's a lot of companies that identify themselves as, as CDPs. But the thing that we set out to do seven years ago when we created the company is exactly what we're, what we're doing. So we had a, we had a vision based on a number of things that we had done at Interclick and uh, a number of things that we had seen at, at Yahoo with respect to just the world changing, the introduction of mobile and the shift towards you know, these fragmented customer experiences and, and having data reside in lots of different places and having it created in lots of different um, environments and, and the need to be able to wrangle all of it and then make it really easy to to integrate into um, 
lots of other systems. And so, you know, the, the, the vision was set really, really early on. I think the way that we talk about it and um, the opportunity in front of us has, has definitely evolved and, and, and up leveled. Um, but at the core, we're doing the same stuff that we set out to do, which is to, to make it easy to get um, data from certain systems out of them and into other places, right? And it's really just about unification and, and, and movement at its, at its core. I think the big, the big difference between starting MParticle and when I started InterClick was, um, was that emphasis on, on culture. So seeing what worked and yeah. being like just being more mindful of the the culture and the environment that we created and using that more as like this foundational building block rather than this passive thing that just kind of accumulates and evolves over time. Yeah, I, one 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 interest. I, I I think it's really interesting that it's so Empirical seven years old. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so you know, generally, there you know, companies have some level of pivot or evolution from their starting point, right, to what they want to be, and that's just whether there's macro forces or environment or whatnot. I think it's pretty, pretty unique that the that the bullseye hasn't really changed that much. Um, and and by the way, companies that do have to evolve, that's not a bad thing. There's just things out of their control or their supply changes or whatever it is. But the fact that the the core of its the core of the business. I actually kind of remember you seeing you and your brother at like Mobile World Congress, like like around that time frame when you when it was just sort of getting when you guys were just developing the idea. But I think that's super unique that you you guys haven't changed course, right? I mean, obviously things change, but the, the what your your strategy or your mission is has not changed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a, a lot of people when we would talk about the business early on, they scratch their heads and be like, "Well, is this this or is it like how do I think about?" It? And now it's like, yeah. "Oh, yeah, okay, all right, you guys." It's like. Surprise, surprise, motherfuckers. Like, we're, we're actually pretty good at this thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I, I, by the way, there's no, you know, there, there's no better form of flattery when you have, you know, some of the largest big tech companies, um, you know, being fast followers of your business, right? So you have Oracle, Adobe, all who want to get into the CDBC cdp space right. um and you know you guys are the category creators yeah i mean that's freaking awesome no it's i mean look it's it, it's humble I, I i i i you know I, I made that comment prior kind of like half half kidding but you know it's it's incredible to see like that you know the the world has kind of caught up to to, to our vision I, you know i think um yeah. companies like adobe and salesforce and oracle like I can only aspire to be, you know, a, a fraction to to have a fraction of their success over over time. They have incredible market share and mind share and staying power, and they've built incredible organizations that operate at just enormous scale. Um, and so for them to 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 say, oh yeah, like what you have done and built is actually the future. Like it's it's incredibly humbling. It seems like there's the, the two the two things that come to mind for me as I've kind of watched your your journey from the sideline is being early 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 on mobile. Um, you know this this isn't it's it's not that new, right? I mean, so the fact that you guys jumped into mobile and obviously and then on the data side, so much conversation and ad tech and martech has been you know oriented around media and impressions and supply and driving revenue. But you guys were thinking about I think a new currency and the value of that currency very early. Obviously, I know there's a lot more, so I'm not trying to say pigeonhole those two things, but from my vantage, kind of being early early mobile and kind of the, 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 the idea that data is fragmented and companies don't have a solution, you know, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty cool story. Well, yeah, I think we're at the intersection of probably three of the most important trends in modern business history, which is, the move to, to mobility, big data, and um, you know the, the the move to the cloud, right? And we kind of represent all of it, which yep. you know we we could have been half right in our vision and still had these huge forces behind us and 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 been I think at least somewhat successful. 
So unfortunately, we're coming on time here. Uh, I feel like we can spend a, another hour diving diving into, you know, a, any one of six different things we've covered here. Where where do you feel the end game is with M Particle? Is it a sale? Is it an is it a is it another IPO that's done it done the right way this time? Um, what do you think? The fuck if I know, man. I, you know, I, I've uh, I, I've stopped trying to like obsess over the outcome or yep. cross the finish line a long time ago, right? My my obsession is in making our customers happy and keeping my employees safe. Yep. And I feel like if if we're doing that. Um, we're going to have a ton of options, right? Yep. And so I love, I love what we do. Um, you know, we talked about culture kind of briefly earlier, yep. but like our, we have a few kind of cultural norms and, and it's like, we hold ourselves accountable to being good people. Um, we create value before we extract value. Um, we own our own karma. Um, we create solutions, not excuses, and we have fun, right? We yeah. celebrate, celebrate the wins. And if you're doing all that, every every day is pretty good. You don't have to you don't have to have that outcome, that sale, that IPO to to kind of validate everything. Um, now we have investors, and we have to be mindful of of, of them, and we obviously want to return capital, but that's that's a, a byproduct of doing the things that you need to do day in and, and day out. Yep. Well yeah. Said. Well and said. Ima imagine it takes time to, uh, to develop the, there's probably a lot of companies and CEOs that would love to have, uh, have those, have those values that you just laid out. I imagine it takes years. I, I've often found like the employee base and how, you know, the employees and how they orientate around themselves generally draw what the values are. They create it, right? You and Andrew facilitate kind of the, the, the 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 vision or whatnot but your team very much kind of creates over the culture and it takes time you don't create a you don't create your sorry i'm at the value you don't create your values day one it takes time to develop that stuff well i, I think you can actually I, I would argue like we so um we created our values really really early on and we said we're only going to hire the types of people that exhibit these values, right? Yeah, good point. Like that your values are the DNA of your, of your culture. Right. And so you can, like my, my takeaway from inner click was that you can actually deliberately shape your culture. Mm -hmm. So um, we've been, you know, now we've had like a cultural evolution because in the early days of M particle, our culture was a little bit different. It was like, just get shit done, hold yourself accountable to getting it done and don't let anything get in your way. But then you get to a point in time where it's less about, you know, fighting for survival. And then you want to build an environment that you're proud of, where if your son or daughter, or if your spouse, or if your, you know, your, your parent were to apply to that company, um, as a as as a job candidate, like would would you be proud of of what you've built, right? And and um, you know that that's been part of the evolution process for. Okay, I'm gonna sneak in one more question uh, before we kind of um, uh, uh, kind of wrap up. And Bill, I know you wanted to touch on the personal side of of life and got to hear about your hear about your son. Um, so, but I just you know as you know with, with kind of. Uh, um, where I'm spending my time in venture and investing, any insights or learnings in regards to your investors? Um, I know this would also be a very long, could be a long answer and a long conversation, but you know, how, how did, um, how did you pick them or they, they picked, uh, they picked you, but any, any interesting insights in regards to the backers of M particle over the last seven years that you can share? Well, we had a lot of people. We have a lot of people on the cap table from our our seed round. Our our Series A was led by Social Capital. I love the fact that you know, but this is back in 2015. They obviously look a lot different these days, but it was all about um, disrupting venture and taking a data driven approach to um, to to venture investing. And they created their their kind of magic eight ball, which is you enter in a bunch of information into. Uh, 
you know, some, some spreadsheet and, you know, at the, the end result is like a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And I thought that was, I mean, that, that struck a chord with, with us, obviously building a, you know, a, a data platform and then also trying to disrupt the status quo. So it felt really culturally aligned there. And then um, our series B was led by Bain Capital and they looked at us during the series A and they were like, uh, we love what you guys are, 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 are trying to do. We're just not sure if you can actually do it. <laughs> and so, you know, we had, we had grown after, after the series A, we'd grown like 300% year over year and they had reached back out. And I was like, well, why am I going to engage if you guys didn't like it last time? Like what's, what's different. And they were like, well, one, we, we did like it. And two, we were, we were wrong and we admit that that we were wrong and i kind of just stepped back and i was like well if they're if they're willing to to admit that then i think philosophically um we're we're probably aligned because as a as a startup you have to make a lot of bets and you're going to be wrong in those bets some of the times and you have to be yep. self-aware and you have to acknowledge it in order to 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 continue to move forward and it was like you know, I I really liked uh, the 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 partner that we had met, um, a guy named Scott Friend. He's he's still on our board to to this day. He's been awesome to to work with. Um, and so like it was it was kind of really easy because we had already known them and there was some inherent level of trust. And then um, for the for the for the Series C, it was about getting uh, an investor that was local and who understood SaaS as we were starting to, to scale. And so, look, there's not a ton of great SaaS investors in, in New York City. Um, you know, I think, I think Mike Brown is, is uh, at Bowery is, is, is one of the best, but he's really early stage. Um, and so we came across Harmony and, and, and really liked Mark and the, and the team that he had built. And, you know, it's a, it's a smaller fund, but it's still a you know four or five hundred million dollar fund. So um, we we went with them, and then with our with our Series D, um, our root capital is a uh, they're a growth equity firm out of out of LA, uh, and they've invested in a number of um, a number of data platforms and a number of companies that are kind of in and around the CDP space, and so they have. Just a bunch of conviction, and 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 they saw what worked and what didn't work at some of their portfolio companies. And you know, as you get bigger and bigger, you want as much um, really specific expertise around the table. At least that's how how I super think. helpful. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, that's sounds like you got some great partners over the years. Bill, I'm going to pass it to you for. Uh... Yeah, we're we're wrapping up here, folks, and we went a little over. I apologize, but uh, you know, I feel like we we could take another half hour and not even cover everything here. So going into uh, you know where everyone was kind of going to be you know stuck in their home, uh, I reach out to you and your wife. Uh, your wife's response was, "Yeah, we're fine with the whole you know being home. Not you know the biggest thing she was scared about was actually being with your son uh, for 24 hours a day. How?" So for those of you, the first time I ever met his son, Connor, um, he was, uh, I don't know, like almost two. Uh, and I came in there there, and, and he came running down the hallway and he just face planted. I mean, he was running towards us, like all excited that someone was visiting the house, face planted right on his face, right on his nose. Any other kid would get up screaming, kicking. He got up like just kind of shook it off and then, ke and then kept running. And, uh, and that basically explains his personality. So how is little Connor doing? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's a, he's a tank. Uh, he, yeah, he, he's loving it. Right. Like he, uh, yeah, he, I, I travel a lot for, for work. And so, you know, for, for me getting to spend more time with him throughout the day is, is, it's, it's awesome. And I think he, he appreciates it. Um, I mean, look, it's it's tough not to to be like a little bit stir crazy these yep. days, especially. It, I mean, it's it's not just him, right? It's we have we have him. We have we have the two dogs who are both like high maintenance, and then like right before he went on spring break, which just rolled into this like forever break. Yeah. Um, Bridget had agreed to uh, to watch the school guinea pig. 
So we, we now like, like we have this four year old guinea pig. I think these things only live like four or five years. This thing's definitely going to die on our watch. And like, it's just, it's just chaos. Uh, but it's, but it's incredible. And I, and I love it. Like these, yeah. these are the times, like we're going to look back and we're going to be like, yeah. you know, that was, that was actually pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember when we had the guinea pig in the house? Totally. Yeah. Exactly. I still don't really still can't really, I grew up with guinea, guinea pigs. I still can't really work out what they are or, or where they come from, but I don't want to ask them any questions. Yeah. yeah. So, so listen, we really appreciate your time. I think um, those people in the industry who know InterClick now know M Particle, I think everyone would agree that like the employees of InterClick and M Particle, the one thing they had in common was they all had this kind of swagger and this belief that, you know, they were doing something special. Um, and that, that, that culture just doesn't happen. That's leadership at the top. Um, I think, you know, people have, you know, kind of like feelings of like who MK is. Um, I'm not sure the people who even know you would be like, wow, I didn't know MK was the guy who, when alcohol consumption is 56% up because everyone's at home, you're not drinking, you're not really watching TV other than Ozark, you're reading a lot of books, you're staying the course. I think you have kind of this focus. Um, you, you know, you say that luck, you know, just happens to follow you. We all know that's not true. Um, you know, luck is is kind of like putting yourself in the right place at the right time with the right team, assembling the right leadership. Uh, so, so while I, you know, while I do believe everyone who uh, is more humble says, "Hey, I was lucky," um, you know, because I, how do I achieve this success without such luck? I, I think you are much more calculated than people probably think or give you credit for. Um, and so I, I think that's your overall, that's your superpower is you have this like focus. I also kind of th don't think you're a person who says, hey, I leave my job and now I'm going home. I think you just have your life and M Particle is just part of your family, like your son or your wife, and you don't have those barriers. So some people will say you're crazy. You never stop working. I just think it's just the culture that you've created. And so that's, that's, you know, you put that all together. I think that's your superpower. Chris. Uh, I'm only adding one thing that I wrote down about halfway through the conversation as it relates to, uh, to, to, to the reading and knowing, knowing MK uh, a bit and need to spend more time with them is dude, I think you're just a student of the game. I mean, I think your superpower is that you study, you learn, you observe, you know, you, you're like a sponge right. and taking, taking all those experiences, but you take it really seriously. It's not that other CEOs or founders don't, but you are a student of the game. That's what I think your superpower is. I love that. I, you know what? I, I love that. So yeah. ladies and gentlemen, we, we spent a little over an hour here with Michael Katz, founder of Intercliff, sold to Yahoo, founder and CEO of M Particle. Uh, he's the, he's, you know, let's, let's see what happens over the next coming months and years. Let's do it. Okay. It. Thanks for being on the show, man. And good uh, luck. With everything. Speak soon, buddy. Yeah. You too. Give, our, give our best to bridge and, and, and Connor. And Connor. Will do. Cheers. Superpowers.